Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 378, The Collusion Edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, speaking to you from Moscow. And it is March 9th, 2018. Okay, yeah, it'll be a fun episode, I can tell already. Uh, As you guys know, we had a nor'easter here. Uh, The sunlights are still covered with snow. The streets are desolated. Half the city was uh, without power still. And the good news is my son has been home from school for three days because they don't have electricity there. He did his chore, so he gets to watch the iPad. If you hear the dishwasher on, it's because Ben did his chores this morning. If you hear snickering, snorting, uh, hooting or hollering, he's watching comedy on his iPad. And uh, it's just the way he watches it. He's a very visual, verbal uh, uh, viewer of media. George, how is the the weather? Da- no, don't tell me the weather. It's going to be good, isn't it? Well, Kevin, we are actually in a bit of uh, we're a bit scared right now because in the next two weeks, spring vacation starts for colleges oh, across right. the United yeah. States, and the hordes will descend upon Florida and South Texas and Mexico and Cancun. And uh, Kevin, you just you don't know what it's like to have a hundred thousand college kids with nothing to do uh but drink and uh do the things that college kids do on the beaches yeah the millennials descending upon the east and west coast of florida Uh, i remember they would pack up buses from the university of wisconsin madison and just send them south and we just stand there from our campus crusade and just wave them by we're not going to go there Sodom and Gomorrah. No, I can't. I, I guess I don't envy that. But the weather's nice, isn't it? Beautiful. No humidity. Bright sunshine. Low seventies. That's why I'm wearing a jacket today. It's cold for me. <laughs> but <laughs> w- this is you no know, March and April. The height of the tourist season here because it's the weather. It's dry. It's mm-hmm. bright, sunny. And then when we get, it, it's also May and June is nice. But then Kevin, as you know, July and August, what happens at three o'clock every day in Florida? Shower. That's the time. That's the shower. Thunderstorm. Thunderstorm. Mm-hmm. All right. So let's move on to the news. Uh, more email. Sorry about that. Uh, I introduced. I said it's collusion. We're going to talk about politics in the church, guilty by association. And I guess the best way to introduce you is to talk about collusion. As you guys know, we've been investigating that President Trump and Hillary for collusion with the Russians. Uh, Apparently the Russians have uh, some spending money, some passing around, walking around money, and they used it to maybe help buy an election. But they don't care just about who's in the Oval Office. Like us in the CIA, we know that you can uh, get more of a groundswell by passing out money with little uh, things that go on in the country. They happen to show up uh, in South Dakota uh, with the uh, Exxon oil. Uh, it wasn't called that. It's the, the oil pipeline. XL. We, XL. Oil pipeline that we argued about for uh, six months and the Keystone pipeline and all that. Um, Obama argued about it. Trump argued about it. Hillary, I'll never do that. And so, lo and behold, we find out that there's collusion because the Russians brought some walking around money because they don't want oil to be at 60 bucks a barrel they would prefer it at 90 because they lose money and we find out that uh they passed out money then we learned that this actually has a church connection because well the episcopal church is the episcopal church george the last few years uh, last year there were indian protests on reservations in south dakota because they wanted to put a pipeline through it to bring oil from the uh, oil from the new refineries opening up in Tex- in uh, texas in canada yeah. and in the dakotas down south to the refineries in the gulf coast uh, louisiana and texas to be turned into gasoline and the Episcopal Church got involved supporting local Native American protesters as well as some members of the Antifa group, which are the hard left protesters. Well, turn, the House Committee on Science and Technology and working with the Intelligence Committee released a report this past week that said Moscow, uh, the, the KGB, uh, was involved in the protests. They were funding some of the protests to keep the price of oil high to prevent the building of a pipeline. Because with no pipeline, the price of oil stays high. With the pipeline, more supply drives down the price. And as you said, Kevin, the Russian economy, Russian military, needs oil money to keep the wheels rolling. 
And so here uh, we don't have proof of collusion between Donald Trump and the KGB, but we now have actually more evidence of collusion, but even though it is unwitting between the Episcopal Church and the KGB. Now, personally, I've always thought the Episcopal Church Center was a nest of pinkos, but Can I say it? Pinko commies. Pinko <laughs> communists. But, but so, you know, now, of course, the Episcopal Church was not aware of this, but here is the problem when you get, when you take an organization designed to spread the good news of Jesus Christ and get in bed with politicians. Guilt by association. Donald Trump and is being slimed because of alleged links to Moscow. And if you use the logic to attack Donald Trump, then the Episcopal Church is guilty, as guilty uh, as he is. Hmm. I also just saw that they're going to join the Me Too campaign. Um, Me Too, as you know, has been the, the hashtag of all those who have been affected by... Excuse me while I... <clears throat> Mrs. Carlson wants to say hi, but I, I, I hit the decline button. Uh, the Me Too hashtag has been used by all those affected by uh, sexual discrimination, sexual harassment, rape in the workplace, all that type of thing. And the Episcopal Church uh, has decided, hey, it's our turn. How's that going to work, George? The Episcopal Church has a dreadful problem of always being way behind the curve behind the curve mm -hmm. of joining the party after the party's <laughs> over whether it be Catherine Roskam the suffragan bishop of New York getting involved in a in a rave Eucharist I remember that <laughs> and uh, you know getting all jiggy and everything up in Harlem and it just was so bad that it you know because at this point hip hop had overtaken uh, in other words they were the wrong cultural wrong milieu if they wanted to be with it they were with it 10 years ago Snoop Dogg was already gone yes and uh, Tupac was already dead so you know let's let's move on well the Episcopal Church has put together the ha the president of the House of Deputies Gay Jennings has put together a special committee to prepare legislation to make the Episcopal Church more aggressive in fighting sexual abuse, uh, harassment, and intolerance. And it announced the names of all the members of this committee. And do you know what, Kevin? 47 people? They're Don't all women. Me. No, you can't have that. Title You're three, four, no, title three says that you can't have imbalance in gender. Right. The, well, that's in the ordination process, uh -huh. but it's been applied across the church. Sure. That, you know, that you have to have equal representation, equal balance. And now the press release that came out said, oh, yes, we have 30 or 40 percent people of color. Uh, we have uh, people of different uh, sexual uh, uh, preferences. And I may be wrong, Kevin. There may be one or two men on this committee, if by men you mean by, by chromosome. chromosome. Yes, of course. <laughs> there may be some transgendered people. But the Episcopal Church is going to put together legislation that sees sexual abuse, sexual misconduct as being only male upon female. Now, I've written church news for t going on 20 years, and I can't tell you how many stories I've written about Episcopal priests, church uh, school chaplains, abusing young boys, mm -hmm. male on male. I've written stories of about men being abused by women in positions of authority, of women being abused by other women, and I've written loads of stories about men abusing women. It There are... <sighs> The human heart is perverse and wicked, and we see that in all this abuse. But to see it just in one direction yeah. is just so... This is this this is 70s feminism. Uh, you know, I am woman, hear me roar. This is third wave feminism taking over the church, the church that it loves, and the, the, and the church that loves it. Now, we talk about this because there's a danger in politics, even if you're trying to do the right thing, um, which the Episcopal Church is trying to do the right thing uh, as they consider it. I saw the ACNA kind of do this as well a couple weeks ago when Archbishop Foley uh, signed a document on DACA and immigration. You posted a nice story uh, to the ACNA uh, Facebook page, and boom, a smoky explosion 
of 10,000 opinions on one side and 10,000 opinions on one on the other side. That was not the intent to divide the church, but that's the danger of politics, George. Oh, it was fascinating looking at the comments. I I knew this was going to be a problem. In my bones, I knew this was a mistake. Not that I felt that uh, Bishop Beach had wrong thoughts, mm -hmm. but rather that that's not really the best public way to go forward with these thoughts. What happened was you've got half the people on the commenting basically saying that if you don't agree with me, you're the Antichrist, you're evil, Jesus would do what I think should be done. And the other half had the exact same opinion, but they were different sides of this issue. That's right. And this is just within the ACNA. And this opened up, all, and, and then uh, the cranks and the trolls and the people, the one who one issue people, all jump in and put in their opinions and preferences. And basically, you've got a self-inflicted wound that need, need not ever have been raised. What ha the, what what happened was that uh, the National Association of Evangelicals, which is not your grandfather's National Association of Evangelicals, <laughs> they have lost their moorings. Mm -hmm. Uh, put out a, a statement urging President, President Trump to basically grant amnesty to the uh, the the called Dreamers, their the, the DACA, whatever you have. They're the children, illegal aliens who were brought here as children and who have been acculturated to the United States. Said just let them stay, plus allowing chain migration, mm -hmm. meaning once you allow them to stay, their nephews and cousins and aunts and uncles down in Guatemala, they should be able to come too because Junior has his foot across the Rio Grande. President Trump has said no to chain immigration. And so what uh, Foley Beach did was come out against President Trump on these very contested issue. Now, I don't there think are that good was... people of good deal on both will yeah. on both sides. <laughs> but what? How does this? How does this build the church by dividing the church? Uh, build a church, and you're dividing it in half. Yeah, and I can still I can provide an example where it went well. Uh, you remember the Manhattan Declaration, mm -hmm. um, where uh, the ACNA and a bunch of evangelical churches signed on to it. And there was no division within the CNA on that. Um, that was a, a good place to put a political chip, so to speak. Um, there, the ACNA on its stand with abortion. That's kind of a good place for it to put its its uh, political chips. There are some bad places where there's already such a divide in the country um, that will spread into the church that it, maybe it's not such a good place in, in hindsight to put that. George, what topic do we never give our opinion on? Women's orders. Why? Why can't we? Because it's like Foley Beach signing the <laughs> the, the, the letter. It just is no win. Mm -hmm. You will annoy and anger and be people on both sides uh, without, you know, our mission is, uh, Anglican Unscripted, is to bring news, opinions, and views, but also to build up the body of Christ, to help people model Christ-like behavior. Absolutely. And, you know, we may not do as good a job as we should, but no. that's our intention. <laughs> but if we, our intention is not to campaign on particular issues. And if you've got something that your audience is divided about, that you're not going to be able to be resolved unless you present balanced views and thoughtful opinions, it's one of the reasons why I'm so happy with what Gavin Ashend has been able to do, because he can speak to these issues in a non-threatening, non-damn you do what I say sure. uh, way of doing thinking. Well, I don't want to compare uh, um, Gavin Ashington to Billy Graham, but Billy Graham in his early days was very political. Um, now, and I'm going from memory. I'm not. He, I was. I came around to this whole situation in the '80s. Um, but I remember he he had political uh, answers to a lot of the the earth struggles at the time, and people yeah, and people Harry, enjoyed that. Harry Truman disliked Billy Graham. He's the only president he and and because Billy Graham thought that Truman was soft on communism. Yeah. Uh, Eisenhower and Graham had a great repute re time, as did Kennedy and jo mm -hmm. Johnson and Nixon. Mm -hmm. You know, all the Carter, way up all the way up. Yeah. Now, and one of the reasons why was that Billy Graham could be a pastor to people as different as Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon. Absolutely. However, 
when I came onto the scene in the 80s, uh, he, you know, he was in his late 60s, he became less political. People would say, Billy Graham, we want you to come down and uh, give us an opinion on this political subject. And he basically avoided that in his later years. And I think there was wisdom in that. Uh, he wanted to be sure that he was remembered for making the main thing the main thing. And it was very helpful uh, in how he's going to be remembered. One of the problems of the Episcopal Church, among their many problems, is that... Uh, were you aware, Kevin, that the House of Bishops of the Episcopal Church issued a statement on gun control this week? I would know that. No, they didn't. Uh, and I, <laughs> guess what? It was of so little consequence you know, hold that on. I didn't did rush. I didn't rush to run it up. I mean, I'll get to it eventually, but do you know what, Kevin? Nobody cares. Yeah, I don't care. The Epis and I'm an Episcopalian born and bred. I'm a part of the trade union. I pay no attention whatsoever to the political uh, thoughts of uh, my lords and masters because they have been talking for 30, 40 years since the Vietnam War and nobody pays attention. I can remember when I was a young priest, or very young, I was in seminary, uh, Edmund Browning told me that it was God's will and that we must support President Clinton in bombing Serbia. Serbia, yeah. Knock them off the earth. Uh, I mean, you know, let's put the credibility of the church in a... Do you remember Wag the Dog? Uh, wag the Tail? Yeah. The dog... <laughs> it's called Wag the Dog. <laughs> attention yeah. from the Monica Lewinsky scandals. So we bombed Serbia. We bombed uh, Sudan. We bombed Pakistan, just as the Independent Council would uh, give out stuff. Mm -hmm. And that was all right with Ed Browning. Yeah. Now, when we started the Iraq Wars with George Bush, that was evil. Yes, that was terrible. Yeah. To say, in other words, I'm taking historical things that people really don't get worked up about anymore, but the Episcopal Church has a dismal track record of making public statements that nobody cares about, not even its own base. And that's the big... Because they... I'm sorry. No, I mean, that's the danger. If you're going to take an opinion on everything, people are going to stop listening. Uh, especially in politics, especially in presidential politics and the politics of the day. Uh, this 24-7 uh, news cycle, analysis cycle, people are tired of it. And the last place they want to hear about it is in their pews and from the leaders of their church. Um, they want to leave the politics to the politician and their relationship with Christ to the leaders of the church. Yeah. You know, the... When a when a political when a when a priest or a bishop gets up in the pulpit and offers his opinion on politics of the day from the pulpit, he is, and I'm going to be strong. He is committing blasphemy. Hmm. He is placing his heart, his thoughts above God's word, the Bible, and in doing so, that is, you don't bring people into the church by proclaiming yourself and your political views. They can stay home and read the New York Times op-ed page on Sunday morning. Instead, you're there to preach the word of Christ and to celebrate the sacraments and help people become closer and deeper and walk with Christ. Mm -hmm. And when you abuse that privilege by getting into politics, you are committing a crime against the church. I really strongly believe that. No. God. Yes, I do. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> In, well, our little parish, our little parish, we have people across the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. We have people of all different rate. I mean races uh gender we have gays and lesbians we have flat earth troglodyte types we have everybody but we we even have eagles and dallas cowboy fans we have under a, the same roof on sunday we have a klingon that counts right you know <laughs> but the, the, the point the the, the point uh, paul said to be all things to all people not in a wishy-washy sense where you just are sort of trying to suck up to people, but rather you need to approach people through love and kindness and willingness to hear them and meet them where they are and preach the word, pure, unpolluted, uncorroded word of God to them. And then guess what? They get it. But if you tell them how to think, they're going to take umbrage and walk away. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, my little church, it's an Episcopal church, and our population in the county has been stagnant and declining uh, since the Civil War. Uh, this is, you know rural florida that is not growing that 
One day the highway will come north from Tampa and we may grow. Yet still this church is double because we don't do politics. We do Christ and Christ only. And the Episcopal Church, since it's done politics, has fallen in half. Amen. George, we've hit 20 minutes. We're going to have to save this next story. You guys can't know what it is for later. We'll do that next week. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 368 of Anglican Unscripted. Why do you always subtract? You subtracted 10 from the number again. You know, we work hard. it's, (laughs) It's because I'm not... See, Kevin, I need to wear... My reading Ooh, glasses. Okay, well, what's the number? And I can see the show notes in front of me. But I'm not as handsome as I am in my fashionable distance glasses. 378.